This is Twit. You're talking about an inflection point where it becomes, you, you use the, the term instrumentarian power, something a lot less benign. What, what is, what is, what is, a, is it happening now? Is it about to happen? It's all around us. So you're absolutely right. And, and you, you, I, I, I forget exactly what word you use, but what you just conveyed was, you know, we, we sort of, we slowly realized what they were doing and we kind of got used to it and we kind of accepted it, yeah. got normalized. It's not exactly a Faustian you know, bargain. It, it's just, you know, we're getting better ads. What's wrong with that? Yes, what, what is wrong with that? And then I, I can, you know, close my laptop or shut my phone and walk right. away from it and it's really no big deal. Right. So I mean it works. So here, I got off Instagram because I kept buying stuff in the middle of the night. It clearly works. <laughs> and maybe I felt a, a, a little queasy that it worked so well. But as you said, I just took Instagram off the phone and all is well again. Or and is all it? is well again. Or is it? So 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 now we're looking at a twenty year arc. Right. We're, we're just about two decades past this invention point. And a lot has happened in that in that 20 years. So we began with targeted advertising, habituating ourselves to that in just the way that that you suggest. And of course, uh, what what the companies were learning was that, hey, the 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 more behavioral surplus I can bring to this operation, the better my predictions. So now we're into economies of scale. So it's not just, um, you know, what Leo is searching for, browsing for, how Leo is spelling. Now the idea to get scale is we've got to invent the methods that are going to follow Leo all over the web. And we're going to be taking, uh, data, behavioral data from, from Leo's actions, behavioral data from which we can create these predictive inferences. And we can figure out how to find that data and how to take those data, even if Leo has said he wants those data to be private. And even if Leo has refused to share those data, and even if Leo, Leo hasn't done anything online around these specific kinds of data, we can put together enough other data that Leo has put online that we can infer critical things that we want to infer about Leo. Uh -oh. So now, <laughs> so now we're, we're moving beyond the simple ad targeting into a deeper set of methods that are actually... Uh, saying no matter what you have decided about this and what you have you know told this company or that about what data you're willing to to share or how you want your data to be used these methods are now designed to bypass to uh, to go around those kinds of barriers and to literally rob you of those decision rights okay Maybe we can habituate to that too. Maybe we can get used to that too. So what's the next thing that happens? We've got these companies now competing over their predictions. And at first it's largely Google and Facebook. This of course begins to spread through Silicon Valley. Eventually it spreads to Microsoft. But more importantly, it becomes the default option for just about you know every startup and app that's coming out of Silicon Valley. So there's more competition, more competition for behavioral surplus, more competition for prediction products. So now it turns out, well, having a lot of the surplus isn't enough. We also need to have a variety of surplus. It's not enough to have scale. We also need scope. So what does scope mean? Scope means we got to get out of this uh out of this laptop, off the desktop, we got to get out into the world. That's where, of course, um, mobility, <laughs> the shift to mobility becomes critical because now the chief supply chain interface is going to be the phone and not the laptop or the desktop. But now we're out in the world. So what is the behavioral surplus that becomes most valuable? It's... Uh, as people have slowly and painfully learned, you know, it's where you are, but it's also what you're doing. 
and then it's what you're doing it with. And then as we ratchet forward over the years with economies of scope, we see economies of scope actually operate in two, two dimensions. One is we've got to have, you know, extend out from the person as far as possible. So everywhere you're going and where you're running and what you're eating and all of that stuff, if you're going into a restaurant or a shop, but also depth, not only extension, but depth. So we want to know how you're feeling. What are your emotions? We want to know what your face looks like. Is it tense? Are you happy? Are you sad? Um, we want to know about your um, what has become known as uh, you know your affective states, and this is how affective computing, which some people will have heard of, which began as a, a kind of you know, nice capability where the computer could learn some things about your emotions and maybe like help you get through a job interview or uh, help teachers uh, better support an autistic child. This was immediately colonized by all kinds of businesses and ad agencies and so forth who want to know what you're feeling. So now affective computing is a uh, very big uh, growth industry in which um, people are using cameras and facial recognition and voice recognition in order to make assessments about how you're feeling. And that becomes very predictive behavioral surplus. Okay, so now we're way beyond targeted ads where... Um, where we're delving into sort of every aspect of your experience and your behavior. Now it turns out that there's a third big discovery, and that is it's not just scale and it's not just scope. The most predictive behavioral surplus comes from actually intervening in your experience, intervening in your activities, and doing subtle things that will shape and nudge and tune and herd you in specific directions that lead you toward the kind of commercial outcomes that surveillance capitalism's business customers are paying for. 